Thank you very much today for joining our CHI hosted webinar from Eurofins Discovery as well as the Structural Genomics Consortium. Today we'll be having a presenter talking about chemical probes and disease and modeling approaches. First, I wanted to briefly take your time to introduce a little bit about Eurofins Discovery. This is going to be an interactive webinar, so please use the chat functions on this webinar so that you may, we may be able to address your questions at the end of the presentation. Eurofin Scientific has been established in France in 1987 and originally started with actually testing wine components. Since then, these testing labs, which are absolutely necessary for many of these products and many of these services, have grown into the biopharmaceutical, clinical diagnostic, environmental, and food and product testing. Today we'll be talking about Eurofin's discovery, which is actually a key component in the biopharmaceutical realm in Eurofin Scientific. It covers over 400 labs in 41 countries and across 40,000 plus staff between these four arms of Eurofin's. Eurofin's discovery in biopharmaceuticals covers very, very deeply the six industry leaders under this one big platform. And this covers from target ID all the way down to preclinical GLP for in vivo models as well as QC. And the six industry leaders that are under this platform are Villa Pharma and Celsia, which are known for their med synthetic and medicinal chemistries. DiscoverX, known for their drug discovery products and services portfolio from kinases, GPCRs, to phenotypic assays, which we'll be talking about today. Merck Millifor, formerly known as Upstate and Chemicon, known for kinases, ion channels, and GPCRs. Sirep is also known for their safety pharmacology, ADME and toxicity. Pan Labs is known for their safety pharmacology as well, as well as some in vivo pharmacology through our partner labs. And then DiscoverX does offer some QC type assays for biologics lot release, and that would be for a different discussion. But today we'd like to focus on the translational phenotypic. We offer various different types of services, and through Eurofin Scientific, or through Eurofin Discovery, the client is able to access single-scope projects for their drug discovery and development needs, iterative projects that require some consultation from the Eurofin side, or we can embark on fully integrated or modular drug discovery. So we have these various different areas of drug discovery that we consider ourselves experts in, all the way from chemistry to in vivo. And basically, the client can work with the Eurofins Discovery as a consultant and then work with other CROs to progress their drug discovery portfolio. Through our different platforms, all of our six companies contribute to, for example, chemistry, in vitro assays, phenotypic assays, ADME and toxicology, in vivo, and some products that customers can also purchase, all the way from early discovery to preclinical. And this just gives an overview of the types of services that are accessible. Today, in particular, we'll be talking about phenotypic assays. In particular, we're going to be talking about human primary cell systems using our Biomap platform. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Suzanne Mueller-Knapp. She studied human biology in Marburg, Germany then followed by a PhD in molecular biology at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden. She had six more years of postdoctoral training in the areas of inflammation and gene regulation at the Karolinska Institute as well as DIBIT, San Rafael Scientific Institute in Milan. Then in 2004, she joined the SGC called the Structural Genomics Consortium in Oxford. The SGC is an international partnership that currently comprises nine international pharmaceutical companies and a large network of academic and industrial collaborators. She has been the project manager of the Epigenetic Probe Project, which generates tool compounds with defined specificity and selectivity for epigenetic targets and headed the cell-based asset group 
at the SGC in Oxford testing the cellular activity of in vitro characterized tool compounds. Currently in a role as COO at the SGC Frankfurt, Suzanne is now coordinating several probe programs, including the Global SGC Kinase Chemical Probe Program and the Donated Chemical Probe Program, DCP. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Suzanne Mueller Knapp, today presenting a presentation entitled Chemical Probes and Disease Modeling Approaches. Hello, everybody. Today, I will talk to you about chemical probes in disease modeling approaches. The webinar will discuss what chemical probes are, and I will point out what is the difference between chemical probes and drug, drug molecules. I will talk you through two case studies of chemical probes, one kinase probe, YAC3, and one bromodomain probe, BRPF. And then I will also talk about dual kinase BR bromodomain inhibitors, but they are not chemical probes, what I will discuss here today. We will talk through phenotypic characterization of chemical probes. And finally, I will also give you some sources of chemical probes, so where you can get the physical samples of chemical probes, and also where you look up the properties of chemical probes in different databases. First of all, I would like to say a few words about the SGC. So the SGC is a public-private partnership which contains government agency, Wellcome Trust, different charities, and nine leading pharma companies. We exist since 2004, and currently the team consists of about 300 scientists located at the University of Oxford, Toronto, Campinas, at Chapel Hill, in Frankfurt, at McGill University, and at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. We work on several different key areas. We started off with a high throughput structural biology, but today I will focus on our chemical biology program. We also have programs on renewable antibodies or binders, and we test our developed probes in patient cell-derived assays. What is different about the SGC, I think, to most other institutes is that we adhere to a very strong open science ethos. So we promptly place all our results, reagents, and know-how in the public domain, and SGC scientists never file any patents. So coming to the topic of probes, probes are compounds that ask a specific biological question. For this, a defined mode of action is required. Compounds need to be extremely selective. We think they need to be freely available, both the physical compounds and also the accompanying data. But we don't need any drug-like properties like high bioavailability, and also we think that the value of the probe is enhanced by the use of a structurally related but inactive control compound. On the other hand, drugs must be safe and effective. They may or may not have a defined mode of action. Often there are IP restrictions and they are not always available. They must have human bioavailability and there's a very high bar for physical, chemical and pharmaceutic properties. At the SGC, we have defined criteria for our probes and there are target related criteria and also some desirable properties. The target related criteria contain the biochemical potency, which we defined at 100 nanomolar and below. Importantly, they have to be active in cells at about one micromolar or below. We always have a wider profiling of the compound included. The compound has to be selective within the family, and we usually say that 30-fold is the cutoff, but for some targets which have a very dominant phenotype, you need a higher selectivity. And we want a biophysical proof of target engagement. Desirable properties are that the chemical matter doesn't contain any paints element, so they are chemically stable. I already mentioned that we would like to have an inactive control compound. We want that all data and reagents are freely available. The compound should be, of course, soluble in aqueous and organic solutions. And maybe, or ideally, there should be chemical and plasma stability. So why do we need chemical probes? 
We need chemical probes because the literature is polluted with bad compounds. And these compounds are either not very selective or not very well characterized. They can be promiscuous, so they hit several targets. Sometimes there is not a very well-defined mode of action. Some of the compounds have very bad physical chemical properties. For example, they precipitate on your cells, produce all weird and wonderful effects. But even after publication of shortcomings of many compounds, inhibitors are still widely used by the community and the next generation of scientists picks up on publications and uses the same compound again. I've shown some example down here. So for example, staurosporin is a very broad spectrum kinase inhibitor, but had initially been described as a PKC inhibitor. And even today, people still use storosporin to answer specific signaling questions re related to PKC. Another example is Iniparib. It was developed as a PARP inhibitor, made it all the way through the clinic, and finally failed in phase three. And this is because the compound binds non-specifically to targets containing cysteines. And here's a third example. This is a compound that is in the literature as a specific P38 inhibitor. And there are more than 10,000 publications on P38, and 90% of these publications use old inhibitors which are not specific, in particular this compound here, SB203580. In the last five years alone, almost 1,500 publications use this compound. But if you look at the profiling of this compound, you see that it not only inhibits P38, but it inhibits a whole variety of other kinase unspecifically. So the first example of chemical probes comes from the protein kinases. And we have done a study in 2010 where we plotted all kinase targets here on the y-axis. And then we looked in PubMed and to see how many publications per target appear. You can see that most of the publication really cluster around a small number of kinases, but a large part of the kinome is completely underexplored. But if you look with methods that are unbiased, for example, RNAi, or you look for driver mutation in cancer, you see that there are many targets to be explored in this undrugged kinome. We also did a study to look in patterns and see to see if industry was working on a wider variety of kinases, but industry of, was doing research exactly in the area where also ag academic scientists did their research. And if you look at the clinical kinase inhibitors and kinases entering clinical trials, you see that this is uh, focused on a small number of kinases, and there are many so-called Me2 compounds inhibiting the same kinase. So there is a clear need to develop tools for this untargeted kinome. The first example here is the compound FM381, which was developed in collaboration with Stefan Laufer at the University of Tübingen. And he developed a highly potent inhibitor against the kinase YAK3, which is 154 picomolar. This is the probe compound. And we al he also developed an inactive control compound which is differentiated here in this position here by an additional methyl group. The compound binds in a reversible covalent manner, and you can see this here in the crystal structure, which trapped one conformation where the compound is non-covalently bound in the structure, and here it is covalent. The compound is also highly selective within the YAC family, it's about 400-fold selective over YAC1 and 2,700-fold over YAC2 and more than 3,000-fold over TIC2. If you look in the whole kinome, you see that the compound is highly selective, only inhibiting YAC3 and a little bit some other kinases like BLK. We also screened the compounds against bromo domains, and there was no significant activity against this target family either. So why did we want to develop a 
selective YAC3 inhibitor. The YAC family consists of four members, YAC1, YAC2, YAC3, and TIC, but only YAC3 is specifically expressed in immune competent cells, whereas the other family members are ubiquitously expressed. Signaling of the YAC family occurs via the gamma chain of cytokine receptors. And in general, YAC3 and YAC1, for example, signal through IL2 to downstream phosphostat 5 We wanted to see if the compound is different to tofacitinib, which is a clinical pan-YAC inhibitor that's been approved for rheumatoid arthritis and other inflammatory diseases. If you look here, these peripheral blood mononucleosides that were treated with tofacitinib, and you look for signaling to phosphostat 5 stimulated with IL-2, you see that tofacitinib very potently inhibits phosphorylation of STAT-5. On the other hand, signaling to phosphostat 3 induced by IL-6 is also inhibited by tofacitinib. On the other hand, our specific inhibitor, FM381, only inhibits signaling through IL-2 and phosphorylation of phosphostat-5, but doesn't affect signaling via IL-6 and phosphostat-3. So we see here that we have a very high cellular selectivity. You have already heard introduction to a biomap profile, and I just want to repeat here that you see on the y-axis the levels of the readout in the different cellular system, which are all based on human primary cells. And on the x-axis here, you see the different protein biomarker endpoints. Here you see the concentration at which the compounds were tested, and all compounds are tested at four different concentrations. In addition to the readout you see in the different cellular system, you can also see if the compound has an antiproliferative effect or a cytotoxic effect. And in gray is the significant envelope showing the boundaries of the historic values for all the compounds that have been tested in this system. So every active has a unique biomark profile, which can be compared to other compound profiles in order to find a signature match, which we'll see in the next slides. So first up here, the FM381, the specific YAC3 inhibitor was tested in the cell line panel, in the cell panel. And you see that the main activity is as expected in the BT cell compartment and also in the T cell activation part, as you would expect from the immune specific expression of the in the immune competent cells. It has an effect on inflammation, immunomodulation, tissue meddling, and hemostasis related readouts. It was very nice to see that the highest database hit was tofacitinib. But you can also see that there are some very clear differences compared to tofacitinib. For example, tofacitinib here has a clear peak in vascular inflammation in the epithelial cells where uh, YAC3 is not expressed. So this is clearly an effect that is not mediated by YAC3, but the other YACs. Another thing I wanted to point out here is we also tested the inactive control to show that inactive is not an absolute term. If you go at concentration as high as we, has been done here, for example, 10 micromolar, you see that the compound is active. But if you use it at concentration, which we recommended, so 100 fold of the IC50 of the probe compound, which would be 150 nanomolar, the compound is indeed inactive. So it's important to say that in negative control doesn't mean that the compound is absolutely inert or inactive. This is really concentration dependent. I want to switch gear here and talk a little bit about another project that, which we did where we looked for compounds that inhibit bromodomains. This was at the beginning of the epigenetic project in Oxford and we 
wanted to see if other inhibitors developed for other targets would also inhibit promo domains. So we screened a library of kinase inhibitors, which also contain many kinase inhibitors in the clinic. And as you can see here, we had a large number of hit compounds. We focused on the PLK inhibitor and the YAK inhibitor here, and you can see if you screen it against the family of bromo domains that they potently not only inhibit the target that they were intended to inhibit, so PLK or YAK, but they also have very potent off-target activity against the BAT family of bromo domains. The clinical PLK inhibitor inhibits BAT family members for around 12 and 24 nanomolar, that's the first and second promo domain of BRD4, and also the YAK inhibitor had very potent activity on BRD4. We went on and tested if this activity was also seen in cells. Here we see FRAP assay. So FRAP is a photo recovery after photo bleaching, and we transfect a cell with our target of interest, in this case here BRD4, which is tagged to GFP and is located here to the nucleus. We then bleach a small area and measure the recovery time and then plot, which you can see here, and then plot the half recovery time to see if there are any differences. If we add a promo domain inhibitor, for example here JQ1, we increase the half recovery time because BRD4 is not bound to chromatin so tightly, so the recovery is much faster. We also tested the yak bet inhibitor and the PLK bet inhibitor that we had identified in vitro, and we see that also these inhibitors potently increase the half recovery time in cells. One of the hallmarks of BET inhibition is CMYK regulation. And you can see here the BET inhibitor JQ1 potently downregulates CMYK expression. And the same is true for the dual inhibitor, PLK BET inhibitor and YAK BET inhibitor. We did a lot of structural analysis to define the mode of action of this inhibitors, and we have colored here the kinase hinge binding group, the inhibitors, and the bromodomain binding group, and you can see in many cases they don't coincide. In some cases they do, and it is therefore likely that bromodomain inhibitors hidden also in other molecules. We collaborated with Eurofins and Alison O'Mahony at the time to look how these compounds would behave biomap profile. And so I will concentrate here on the right-hand side. If you see here, this is the cluster of BET inhibitors, IBET-151, PFI-1, and IBET and JQ1. You see they all cluster in the same spot. Here you see the YAK inhibitors, which don't have any BET activity. And then in pink here, you see the dual yuck bed inhibitor, which then in a concentration dependent manner will have a predominant BET inhibition profile. Similarly, you can see this here that the polypharmacology of the dual PLK BET inhibitor, here is the pure PLK inhibitor in a dose dependent manner. And again, the dual BET PLK BET inhibitor will cluster at higher concentration with, with the BET inhibitors. I would now like to move on to bromo domains. I already talked briefly about the BET family of bromo domains. Bromo domains have an excellent druggability and a large number of bromo domain probes have been developed in the past about nine years. So bromodomains bind to acetyllysine residues, in particular to the, the tails of the histone. And the whole family consists of 61 different targets, which can be subdivided in eight families. They're inhibitors for almost all 
branches of the Bromo domain family now available. And I will talk today about a specific subfamily, the BRPF family, which consists of four member BRPF1A, which however doesn't bind to acetylysin, and BRPF1B, BRPF2, and BRPF3, which all three bind to acetylysin residues. We developed three probes with different profile and the control compound. And we also identified a phenotype for inhibition of the BRPF family, which I don't want to go into further detail. But we found that if you inhibit BRPF family, you also inhibit osteoclast differentiation and activity. So osteoclasts are macrophages that are involved in bone remodeling. Here you see the profile of the BRPF bromodomain probes. We have two barn, pan BRPF probes from different scaffolds, OF1 and NI57. And we have one BRPF1B specific probe called PFI4, which is from a similar scaffold as OF1, but only inhibits BRPF1B. We have profiled these compounds extensively in a cellular context. So we've done nanobread to identify their cellular potency. We have done FRAP assays, which I already explained previously. And you can see here that already at 500 nanomolar, we have a very significant increase of recovery half time, both for BRPF1B and also BRPF2. In addition, we did SETSA, cellular thermal shift assays, where you heat cells which are transfected with the flag tag labeled target of interest, in this case, with or without the inhibitor. And you see here that the NI57 compound greatly stabilizes BRPF1B a whole, across the whole temperature range. Whereas if you don't add the inhibitor, the protein crashes out very quickly. You also see that the compound is specific for BRPF1B because we all did the same experiment here with BRPF1A, which doesn't bind to acetylysin residues, as I mentioned, and also doesn't bind to the inhibitor. And therefore, you see no difference between treated and untreated cells. Again, we did a biomap profile of the BRPF inhibitor because very little is known about this family apart from their role in osteoclasts. But also the biomap profile didn't provide any additional hints. But the, the whole profile is fairly flat, and you can see what is happening here is really not in a dose-dependent manner. There's maybe a little bit of MMP9 activity. So the, the upper profile is the one of NI57, the very potent pan-BRPF inhibitor, which inhibits BRPF1B in the low nanomolar range, and also is very potent on the other two BRPF family members. We were very surprised when we tested PFI4, which is the BRPF1B specific inhibitor across the biomap panel. And we saw some intense and even dose dependent repression of prostaglandin E2, whereas this peak is probably unspecific because it's not dose dependent. And we only could figure out what was going on when I went back to all the additional profiling that we have done. And this comes back to the point that I made in the beginning that it is very important to profile the compounds as broadly as possible, because we found after we had profiled it in the CERA panel that this compound also inhibited serotonin receptor quite potently at about 90 nanomolar. And serotonin is involved in regulation of soluble prostaglandin and which explains the effect seen here. So this is clearly a very specific effect of the off-target. I would like to finish now with giving you some hints where you can find chemical probes. So the SGC 
has now a large number of chemical probes. We have more than 50 chemical probes, mostly from kinases and epigenetic proteins that we have developed over the years. They are also available via commercial vendors, for example, Sigma, Aldrich, Tokris, and Cayman Chemicals. Böhringer has a program where you can order compounds directly from them called OpenMe. The Nathaniel Gray Lab also offers compounds and we have since two years a very exciting project which is called uh, donated chemical probes so in this program the pharmaceutical industry or high-ranking academics have offered compounds that are pharmacologically active in cells they're all supplied with a negative control and what is often not the case for the SGC chemical probes, they are frequently suitable for in vivo experiments. Also, these probes are reviewed like all SGC probes in a rigorous and independent quality process. So you can be sure that they are of very high quality. You can order these probes directly from this website and we will send you a small sample. If you want to look for chemical probes, there are a number of good databases like probe minor, probes and trucks, open targets, and so on. Please have a look there. Don't always look just in old publication, but look at the evaluation of these probes in the databases. Finally, there is a, a very nice tool, which is called the Chem Chemical Probes Portal. This is a website which in a very easy manner gives you a quality check of the probes. This is expert driven, so there are 140 experts that evaluate the probes for you and they use a very simple four star rating system and basically any probe that has three stars and more is endorsed by them. That helps you in a very easy manner to learn about the best practices, also gives you a recommendation on use. And there are also a few compounds listed there which shouldn't be used. So in summary, I think I told you about how important it is to establish on-target engagement in vitro and in cells. It is key to have a good profiling of each compound within the family, but also out, outside the family. For example, the example with the serotonin receptor. It's important to have a large off-target panel. It's good to have several scaffolds that is crucial for target validation as one scaffold could have a series of off-targets. Please remember that the negative control compounds is, doesn't mean it is inactive. It only means it doesn't hit the target. And also this is concentration dependent. That's any way you please, please use any compound at the right concentration. You cannot use a picomolar inhibitor at 10 micromolar. And if you have a, a nice panel of defined cell assays, you can also establish a compound signature or fingerprint of the compound, as we've seen, for example, in the Biomap example. Also, it is good practice to make all information available and easily accessible. With that, I would like to acknowledge the people who have contributed I unfortunately cannot acknowledge everyone who has contributed because these are huge projects. But the SG in Frankfurt, I would like to acknowledge the group of Stefan Knapp in Oxford, in particular for the Bromo Domain project. I would like to acknowledge Oleg Fedorov, uh, who runs the screening group, Paul Brennan, the chemist, and Panagis Filipopoulos, which is a crystallographer, and my former group members, uh, Julia Meyer. Catherine Rogers and Vita Fidele. At Eurofins, we had a very nice collaboration with Dan Trieber, Pietro Cicere, and Alison O'Mahony. I already mentioned that the YAC probe originates from the lab of Stefan Laufer and Michael Forster, the chemist who produced it. I would like to thank Paul Fish, Def Owen, 
Matt Robbers for good collaborations over the year and the whole SGC team for their continuous support and making this a fun place to work. Thank you for your attention. Our first question, how many chemical probes are available and for which targets or protein families? So there's a very good coverage for the epigenetic protein families, in particular bromodomains and histone methyltransferases. That's through the SGC program on chemical probes and through uh, in the donated chemical probes, we have a um, variety of different families, um, for example, proteases, uh, GPCR, uh, agonist, antagonist, and different enzymes like proteases. Our next question, are chemical probes suitable for in vivo or animal experiments? Yeah, as I already pointed out, so the most S3C probes are not optimized to be suitable for in, in vivo experiments because that requires a whole new layer of chemistry. But from the again, from the donated chemical probes, most of them are suitable for in vivo use. Perfect. At which concentration should I use chemical probes? Yes, that is a, a question we are being asked quite frequently. So for each individual compound, we of course provide a recommendation on use based on the potency in cells, the biochemical potency, but also the window to the off targets that we have defined. But frequently chemical probes are used as part of a library. And then, of course, you cannot dose each individual compound so carefully. So there is an, an easy way out. For example, in a donated chemical probe program, we provide the compounds as stock solution. So you only have to dilute them with the same factor to come at the approximately right dosage to use in cells. And that is usually 100 nanomolar or 1 micromolar. You definitely shouldn't go higher up as 10 micromolar for uh, chemical probes because then even with the best characterized compounds, you will start picking up off targets when you overdose. We have a question from Elahi. Are there chemical probes that are cancer specific but that don't target a molecular driver, rather they target a specific cellular function, such as apoptosis. So your, your, I guess your question means the pathways specific probes and uh, as opposed to target specific probes. We haven't really worked on those because we, our focus is really on providing more information on the biology of a target so that it helps in target validation and ultimately to develop a specific drug. Whereas um, I think the question that you are asking is are compounds that could also have specific polypharmacology, so inhibiting several targets in the, in the same pathway. I wouldn't really call this a chemical probe. All right. Thank you so much. Wang asks, if I'm using the chemical probes for diagnostics in a human, how, does the, how is it that the bioavailability information is not required? So I think that comes back to the same point. So chemical probes is what I defined in the beginning. So are compounds that are active in cells. The bioavailability is comes into play when when you use this in a in an animal model and a probe per se has not been optimized for that. So now for the donated chemical probes that originate from the pharmaceutical industry, of course they they have been optimized to be bioavailable. I see we are coming up to the end of our time. We have a couple more questions but I will plan on forwarding those along to Suzanne and you'll receive your answer via email. With that, I would like to thank Eurofin's Discovery for sponsoring today's web symposium. I'd like to thank our presenter for today, Dr. Suzanne Mueller-Knapp. 
Most of all, I would like to thank those of you who came and spent this time with us. We know you're very busy, and we're very grateful that you chose to spend this time here. We hope we found some answers for you for your research questions. So on behalf of CHI's Global Web Symposia Series, I'd like to thank you again for attending and hope to see you at future CHI Web Symposia. Thank you all so much, and have a great day.